I'm Gar Old, and welcome back to another episode of Masters of Controlled Chaos. And this month, we're going to be looking at one of the most elusive figures in all film, one of the most mysterious figures, Terrence Malick. Uh, frustrating, methodical, brilliant, poetic, philosophical, all words I would use to describe Terrence Malick and, and his films. Well, Terrence Monk films in particular. Um, but if you're new to this series, what I do every single month is I break down a classic director, a director who I think is a master of control chaos, and I talk about the central idea of what makes them great. I also look at three films that signify their career uh, and sort of break down sort of their journey, and three films I really enjoy and sort of analyze them and how that relates to their overall career arc. Last week I didn't really mention it, but we are going to be on a new set uh, for the next few months, about five I'd say. Uh, um, but, you know, this happens every once a month, so of course stay tuned for every single week where we do Forgotten Oscar films. But if you want a little bit more lengthy, a little more in-depth discussion, uh, less sort of uh, history and sort of analytical based, um, but very much more um, opinion based and trying to discover a film uh, filmmaker and his uh, um, filmography. You know, last week uh, we talked about um, Reds with Warren Beatty and we talked, sort of explored that a little bit more in terms of his directing style. So if you like something like that, Keep watching these videos, they come every single month, and I don't really have a, a pick for next week, or uh, for next month, excuse me. Um, so if you have any suggestions in terms of directors that I do think I should cover, uh, please let me know in the comments down below, that'd be quite the help. Um, but Terrence Malick, he's a very interesting figure, and I call him one of the most elusive, you know, en enigmatic f filmmakers. Uh, of our era, really, because if you don't know how his career sort of shapes out, um, he makes a movie first um, in 1970, uh, I want to say three, 1973 with Badlands, um, and then another movie in 1978 in Days of Heaven, and then there's a 20 year gap where he doesn't make another movie until 1998 in the, for The Thin Red Line, and then another sort of seven year gap, um, The New World, and then a six year gap, The Tree of Life, and, and, and after since that, it was continually making films. You know, he made um, three films in the, the 20th century, starting in the 70s, but already in the 21st century, he has made six films, including, you know, Tree of Life in 2011, and so in 2012, the next year, made a film, um, and then 2015 and 2017. And I'm doing this episode because in a couple of weeks, his film, um, A Hidden World, is going to be premiering at uh, Cannes Film Festival. So that, that, that should be really interesting to see, especially after seeing all of his movies, to see how that's sort of respected and judged, because as of right now, his film does only have these sort of three chunks that I would sort of argue and sort of classify his films in. And I think as his, the years have gone on, he's become less and less, um, you know, his, his fan base I think has grown stronger, but I think there's been less and less people joining it and more people actually leaving it because of his sort of leaning into his styles. Um, and I think his style really is, is that of, of, of a visual poet, I think is the, sort of the, the best way I saw it on Google when you're just looking up um, for Badlands, I believe, or No Days of Heaven. Um, just the description calls him sort of a visual poet um, or screen poet, um, which I think is just a really great way to do it because he's not uh, uh, you know someone like a Quentin Tarantino or an Aaron Sorkin that prefers sort of the um, dialogue of everything. He prefers using cinema at its pure, purest form um, in, in a purely visual sense. And um, I think in a lot of ways, has really leaned into that in a lot of ways, doesn't want to make, um, you know, normal sort of kind of movies. He almost yearns for the silent picture days. You know, he wants to make sort of these, uh, use sound and use images to really portray the film. And he, as such, you know, I think all of his, be uh, all of his movies are undeniably beautiful. I, I think definitely over the years, I'm um, working with, uh, Cinematographer Chivo Emmanuel Lebeski, starting with new, the New World and onwards for every single one of his films, he's developed a style that's very um, in, in line with Emmanuel Lebeski's, but also sort of uh, Terrence Monk's own, very much handheld. Um, a lot of his sets, as you sort of read more about him, are improvisa improvisational. So there's a, a script, but often the script gets thrown out, and they make just shoot whatever they want, whatever they feel at the time and just shoot a lot and then sort of maybe find the story um, within the editing room. So now if you look at a movie like something like Back to the Future, that would be chaotic, that would be impossible because that's trying to tell sort of a linear narrative story. Um, but Terrence Buck is interested in that. He's interested in visuals and he's interested in big themes and um, particularly phys philosophical themes. Many of the themes that run throughout his films uh, include sort of man's place in nature, um, uh, 
the idea of the mind, I would say, and sort of how we sort of process things uh, in terms of our actions, uh, you know, morals versus ethics, I would say. You know, even in the Tree of Life, he tries to contemplate sort of uh, the entire universe itself. Um, you know, these aren't sort of structural, sort of linear narrative plots. You know, something like Badlands is, um, but as he's moving on, something like, if you could tell me really the plot of Knight of Cups, I'd, I'd be impressed. Or even something like Song to Song. It's like, it takes place at a music festival and there's some sort of, you know, um, romance and sort of relationship issues, but even that's sort of not saying a lot, especially for some of his films, um, which are, you know, d over two hours, a lot of them, for a lot of people, seem meandering, which I do want to sort of uh, touch on because I, th I know a lot of people are not Terrence Malick fans, and I kind of understand that um, because he's a frustrating filmmaker, especially I think a lot of his re more recent work, which I haven't really been connecting to in personally because, you know, sometimes you can say um, everything but then say nothing at all. Um, just by putting everything out there and telling the audience to interpret it, well, you're not really having sort of somewhat of a semblance of, of a narrative. You're almost doing every painting style imaginable and then you're know, trying to tell the audience to figure it out, but maybe you don't really know yourself. Um, you know, maybe that's just how I interpret it, that a lot of his films, especially his recent ones, I wouldn't say start out with them, but they are very distant. I mean, in a lot of ways, he's trying to make art on screen, you know? It's just trying to put a visual image on there, recurring visual images um, with some general sort of philosophical themes. Um, but very low semblance of story, and uh, just try to understand and try to evoke a, an emotion, which is what I think he largely is trying to do. Um, especially with this narrative style, where um, you could, you know, some of the actors, because it's so improvisational, they would just be told, you know, here's a camera, go and, and shoot something. Or in a lot of ways, you'd be giving a great performance, and then, you know, you'd look and you'd see. Uh, Terrence Malick or Chivo, whoever's operating the camera, um, will be looking at uh, and shooting a butterfly or something, you know. That's just sort of how his films are constructed, especially with the editing. I mean, in a lot of ways, his films are described as uh, dreamlike. Um, he is oftentimes, especially in his later films, able to capture the idea of memories um, um, in terms of uh, those two are sort of linked because it, there's almost a sublime, um, heavenly kind of aspect to a lot of his films in the way that um, this, the camera, in a lot of ways, can either be third person or omniscient. And I say third person because it's almost like a video game where you're following behind the person. It's almost like you're a person in the movie from a POV perspective, just sort of following behind them. But I always I like to use the comparison of a video game because when you're playing Uncharted or something like that, you're in a third person view. You're seeing, you know, uh, Nathan Drake's uh, back, and you're controlling him. But you can still control the camera, and you can move the camera in the video game um, to show sort of the front and sort of pan around and look around and sort of have sort of an omniscient kind of camera, um, which I, he often does. So he does these sort of following sort of tracking shots, and you know I, I would think song to song into the wonder, wonder and night of cups are often. I'm thinking of the images that come to mind in those films. And they're very much sort of, of you know walking behind Christian Bale, but then oftentimes you know something like the thin. The Thin Red Line or The New World, um, he has an omniscient camera where there's not really a singular protagonist, um, and or maybe times he'll just cut to uh, little moments in nature, or he'll float above um, the, the protagonist, uh, especially in his earlier films, using things like crane shots um, and, and elevated shots compared to uh, other things such as the more handheld style, even though it is more handheld, it's not Jason Bourne, no, don't get that sort of impression. It's definitely sort of a, a floating, gliding, sort of steady cam, but still moving, um, uh, kind of a, a film. Um, so really for Terrence Malick, what you have to know is that you have to go on into it sort of almost knowing his aesthetic. That's why I probably start with, I would start with Badlands and actually work your way through. I think that's sort of a, a nice gradual progression up until you get somewhere like Till Song or Song or even Void of Time, which he has you know, increasingly become experimental. I mean, especially his later films, I would call them art films or even experimental films um, because of their sort of reliance uh, on very little story and just images and trying to uh, construct an era of that way. So in a lot of ways, because he's seen, had so much acclaim, he's definitely, I think, the most experimental film, filmographer that has all this sort of power and acclaim in, in Hollywood, and I'm not sure if he's gonna go down that route, which I think we're in an interesting time right now, because a lot of people are saying Song to Song, Night of Cups, and to the one of this sort of brief little period that weren't as critically acclaimed and didn't get a lot of box office, and very much art experimental films are sort of his trilogy. You know, The Tree of Life was his sort of a comeback, uh, 
but now you know people are arguing maybe he needs a few years between movies because he can really sort of lament and sort of understand what he's trying to say and say it because I think he uses his best when he has sort of a little bit of a structure and they can work throughout that and explore that topic instead of just saying so much that's so abstract um, to maybe me and, and I know other people too maybe I know I'm, that's a problem with me that I don't understand some of his um, things that he's trying to say but I think that he is very abstract in a lot of ways and you're either on board or you're not and, but sometimes that can make for a very frustrating uh, viewing experience despite that I still like a lot of his films um, I think he's a really incredible cinematographer which, uh, cinematographer um, well, he's not a great director with really beautiful cinematography and great visuals, aesthetics throughout all the films. Um, speaking of which, the first book I'm going to go, the first movie I'm going to talk about is his 1973 movie, Badlands. Okay, so Badlands, this is the reason I, I did this episode in the first place. I'm a huge, huge fan of Badlands, and really, I think for a lot of people, Terry Spock films can all the way be these sort of transcendent experiences. If you really respond to the, the visuals and the emotion of the story, which I think he's really trying to capture is emotion, you really become advocates of him. And you'll see every one of his movies because you want to get that feeling because it's so intoxicating. And in a lot of ways, why people go to films. So even while I watch movies like Night of Cups, I still think that, you know, oh, there's someone that really loves this. And that in itself deserves to be respected and, and, and talked about. And for me, that's what happened with Badlands, which is why I really respect Terrence Bell, even though I don't re even connect to personally um, uh, his latter half of his filmography. Um, that being said, uh, you know, Badlands is, is something that I would, it's akin almost similar to uh, last month's episode, David Lynch with The Straight Story. I think that he's similar to David Lynch, an incredible sort of uh, visual filmmaker, but needs a little bit of structure, needs a little bit of the story to guide him um, and to allow him to connect and say something. Um, and I think he does this in his, you know, in this film, in his most plot heavy film. Um, and for me, I'm a person who always connects to the visuals of the film. When I'm always sort of thinking about films and I'm reminding myself about films, I think you should challenge yourself too. Do you remember certain lines of your favorite films? Or do you remember images? For me, I have sort of certain images burned in my mind. And when I think of films and I reminisce on things, I'm sort of letting it play out in my head. I'm not necessarily hearing the words, but I'm sort of seeing the images uh, of, you know, of the movie. Um, in my head, and I think Badlands is definitely a movie that, uh, one of the best movies I've seen, including new releases and, and old movies in the past few years, um, because of those images that are already burned into my mind. Of course, the burning house, um, the drives are driving the car in this flat sort of you know, Badlands, sort of these flat, um, empty places. Um, so it's really a beautiful film. Uh, there's less of that sort of handheld style as his first film. And um, there are some really great sort of tracking shots uh, through the streets and stuff like that, which um, was in 76, so this, you know, the steady cam didn't exist, so it's not quick, but it is sort of kind of a slow sort of pace back uh, and does feel kind of modern in a lot of ways. Different, a lot of different crane shots, sort of sweeping pan shots, which I really appreciate, a lot of wides. Um, but more than uh, you know, just the visuals of the film, which really speak to me and are really beautiful, um, are also the story. And I think uh, Terrence Malika here actually has really these two very interesting protagonists in uh, Kit, played by uh, Martin Sheen, and um, of course, his SpaceX character, Holly. Um, so with Kit, um, I think he's one of the most mysterious characters on film because of his, his any charm in the film, and we understand why um, Sissy sort of falls for this guy, but his charm and his ability to sort of um, woo people, but also, um, you know, as we, as we learn and go throughout the film, his sociopathic tendencies, you know, he's really uh, the charismatic killer in a lot of ways. Um, and he has, Martin Sheen brings so much to the character um, because you understand his charisma, you understand sort of his pain in a lot of ways because of his, maybe his upbringing and his sort of lost place in the world. But you also understand that he's uh, sociopathic, but in a lot of ways how the film shoots it, which is why I appreciate its visual style, is uh, how it's just distant in a lot of ways. That the killings in the film are not uh, touched upon and are not really stressed in a lot of ways. Many times, You'll, you'll just kill someone and they won't even glorify it, they won't you know, use close-ups, they won't emphasize the music. Um, it'll just sort of happen. You know, the only time where you really sort of get to chaos is um, during the house burning scene. 
And we saw that, that, that handheld camera and sort of a shaky, sort of chaotic sense. But uh, after that scene, I think that's sort of officially symbolizing his his first maybe kind of act of violence. But then afterwards, they become increasingly sort of shot in these wides, increasingly sort of thrown away. They just ha sort of happen. They're not really confronted. Um, and which sort of makes you question, you know, why is this SpaceX character, Holly, um, going along with all this, which I think is almost the central reason and character and sort of central theme of the movie, um, which is the almost the idea of sort of moral versus ethics, you know, knowing sort of what is ethically right to do, but then um, morally will you sort of choose to do that? You know, I think Holly, we understand it in her narration, which is another sort of key trademark, uh, Terrence Malick element. Um, we understand her narration, um, that she's against these and she doesn't understand why and she has an idea but she has not maybe a full picture. But really she understands the situation that she's here. You know, the guy, you know, um, he's, he's on the run with her, that's all I'll say because I don't want to spoil the movie. Um, you know, that's a, a significant aspect of the film. She understands that she's not a dumb character. She's not this sort of innocent, sort of docile character. I think I, think she, I, I give her more credit than that um, because she knows what, what's right to, to do. Um, but it can only be described as, described as almost a primitive element uh, that she goes with her. There's, a, there's an alluring sort of magnetic element to um, Kit that she's obviously um, compelled to and drawn to um, that she almost can't explain. Um, I've heard it often described as sort of instinct versus reason. Um, I think this is a very interesting sort of topic um, and that I've always been sort of connected to because, you know, so many times, you know, we know that you're not supposed to eat the food that's bad for you, but we still do it anyways. You know, why? You know, do humans sort of have a, a, a predetermined sort of nature of self-destruction? Is that something innate to their behavior? I mean, there's a lot of philosophical things that are within this, but what I like about this movie is that you can explore more about them. But in the, in the front face, it's still sort of a, a fun, exciting, not really exciting, but an interesting sort of, uh, you know, road kind of movie. Um, kind of a genre picture. I mean, this, Terrence Malick maybe could have gone this direction, but even with Days of Heaven, we see him sort of go away with this. And I think I compare this movie with Days of Heaven because of, in terms of its um, Americana kind of a landscape. Uh, this one's being set in the 50s. Um, uh, we definitely get time in sort of these empty lands and often these uh, small houses. Um, and really, I think this film... Uh, so, including some of his others, in terms of uh, tackling the topic of um, man's place in the world, you know, I think that the young characters are perfect protagonists in a lot of ways because they um, uh, understand and that this is a point in your life where you don't really know what you're going to do, you don't know um, where you want to go, um, you don't really know your, your place in the world just yet. Um, if you have one at all, you're sort of discovering that, you're figuring that out. Um, and for Kit, he's unfortunately gone to this sort of uh, murderous path because he just wants to run away and wants to look sort of recklessly because things in his life, you know, it hasn't been going the way um, he necessarily wanted to. So both of these characters are really well developed, really interesting. There's grander philosophical themes if you want to explore. There's some really amazing visual images that really have burned in my mind. Um, and I think that sort of um, aspect of this career would be sort of the American realist as aspect of this career, um, taking from uh, painters like Andrew Wyeth or Edward Hopper. Um, really just uh, a beautiful movie to look at. Uh, incredible performances and great characters by both Sissy Spacek, who's starting to become one of my favorite actresses, um, and then Martin Sheen uh, with his character of Kit. It's a great movie I'd, movie I'd recommend to everyone, and actually a movie I'd say start off with, because what I did is I saw The Thin Red Line and The Tree of Life before I did this miniseries, just understanding Terrence Malick, and I was like, okay, I, I like it. I, I'm not in love, necessarily. Um, I was kind of maybe a little bit mixed, and then I saw Badlands, and it sort of was a key, and then I locked the left thing. So I think if maybe you start with Badlands, and you sort of explore his career, like I just did. I just rewatched all his movies for, for the series, um, or watched all his movies for the series. I didn't rewatch all of them. Um, that'll be an interesting um, kind of experiment, and I want to see how that works for you guys. But definitely check out Badlands. It's, it's a great, great film. And then we'll move on into my next pick, um, which is going to be The Thin Red Line. So The Thin Red Line can only be described, sort of personified as um, hell on earth. Uh, really is sort of my encapsulation of it because 
of, of his um, incredible grim sort of um, gritty um, war um, aspect to it but then also bringing Terence Malick's light uh, dreamlike nature focused touch to it and it's really a beautiful combination I think um, while not my favorite Terence Malick film I really really enjoy it and maybe I would argue his best film because this is definitely the film where when I think of maybe a Terence Malick film and how he has established his visual style over the years, uh, this is the one um, that I think of, or the one that really, the one that really starts it. Maybe not peak Malick because, really, I would say maybe that's the New World or the Tree of Life. Um, this stuff they start at. There's a lot of these uh, handheld cameras. Um, there's a lot sort of om omniscient views of the editing. Um, it, it is long. Um, but quiet, quiet sort of beautifulness, um, often intercutting with nature, um, and nature definitely plays a, a huge part in this film. Um, but also the story structure. This is definitely an establishment of a style because unlike Days of Heaven, which is, you know, uh, didn't have sort of a straight linear um, and narrative, still had sort of a, um, a story that you would follow in a, in a basic narrative. Um, Badlands, of course, having sort of a plot as well. Um, this one never really has a singular, singular protagonist. It's very much about the men of war starring, you know, a star-studded uh, A-list cast of all sort of up-and-coming young men who, you know, you know, John Travolta's in the scene and, and George Clooney shows up in a cameo and there's so many just real great parts. Um, and, and I say hell on earth really as my depiction of it because of uh, the way it's shot but also sort of how um, Terrence Malick tells the story, released in the same year of Private, Saving Private Ryan, a very different film, um, almost hard to compare despite being 1998 World War II war films. Um, they're very so different and it shows you how, you know, it's not really, you know, the Roger, great Roger Ebert always says, you know, it's not a, um, what it's about, it's how it's about it. Um, and this is great examples where, the, you know, they're both about the same thing, but they're only both, you know, Saving Private Ryan and this movie are both very different films in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, for this film, I said hell on earth because um, he often, uh, Terrence Malick often says, uh, draws comparisons between sort of the war um, and then sort of nature. Um, you know, this is a place um, in Japan on this hill, this great grand green hill um, with this jungle sort of all around them. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a place and it's incredibly beautiful. It's almost... Um, he shoots it heaven, heavenly in a lot of ways. It's really beautiful and majestic and um, really, you can tell it's just sort of um, love for the beauty of nature and sort of how, you know, there's a war going on, but if you just look around you, you know, there's this incredible, beautiful place. Yet, despite in this great, incredible, beautiful place, one of the most atrocious, act, maybe the most atrocious act on planet Earth, you know, the idea of murder um, occurring all around them. Um, and there's really just stark color differences in the film. Of course, green is a very strong element. The, the, the soldiers are all wearing green. They're in the grass on this green hill. There's jungles of green all around them. Um, and then uh, the sort of opposite of that would be blood, of which this movie has a lot of. It's definitely a, a gory film. So if you're maybe against that, watch a Badlands, which has sort of distant killing. This one, which is almost the opposite of Badlands, uh, where Badlands doesn't even rel uh, relish and sort of acknowledge the killings. This one uh, very much so does. Um, it's those in between times. We rarely even see, you know, action where we see a guy shoot someone and they fall down. Um, we don't see that until very later in the film. It's a lot of confusion of war and it's a lot of sort of the, the intimidation, sort of the incredible sort of weight and bearing that can put on so many of these young men that in, in that way they would be similar to, to Saving Private Ryan. And, and I say that because, you know, if you look at sort of the, a color wheel, we have the green on one side and then it's complementary color being of course red. So we have the, the blood of the red in the blood and then the, the green in the nature, a stark contrast. Um, and hell on earth, of course, hell sort of has a sort of a reddish tone in a lot of uh, literature and, and art. And green, of course, seeing you know blue or very heavily sort of nature and green is a signifying uh, color. And these colors, I think, mean things in terms of life and, and earth and, and health. Um, 
and it's very much on display here. Um, but aside from sort of the incredible, beautiful, omniscient kind of floating camera going from one protagonist to the next, it's how it, it's shot and what is being focused on. Um, a lot of times it shows the length of war. This one, there's just one battle, there's multiple battles, and they have to sort of slowly progress, and there's these multiple squads, and by having no singular protagonist, it doesn't make him the sort of center, sort of hero of the story with one squad, that's sort of look at their thing that's controllable, manageable. It, it involves really the entire um, American army, and even the Japanese army um, in, in this sort of attack. In this raid and invasion of Japan, um, there's really the the intimate sort of small moments in between war is almost a lot of this film. We often see times of them just waiting around in the bush. You know, what's the next word? Calling on phones, uh, clearly confused. But then we'll cut to a, a guy, and there's a great scene where he just touches a leaf and it sort of um, uh, sort of or a plant and sort of like collapses in on itself or guys who are just looking at the grass uh, or just appreciate things or you know we'll see sort of maybe a dying struggling bird or we'll just cut to an orangutan and they're just doing their own thing and you know I think Terrence Malk is definitely saying the message of you know nature is permanent and this sort of war and the stuff is uh, impermanent and that this will sort of be all around us and that you know we're not even looking at sort of this beautiful world that's around us we're trying to, we're, we're fighting with each other and that's for, um, that's um, the argument that we're having instead of sort of living in nature, living amongst each other and within this sort of unified system. And that, you know, that Earth, despite all this sort of short, brief uh, moment uh, of uh, destruction, will still sort of wash away the blood eventually and will continue to, continue to exist. Um, and that... This is temporary and sort of Earth is, is permanent in a lot of ways, sort of permanence versus impermanence. Um, and we often see these sort of small moments I really enjoy of um, these these men sort of connecting with nature despite this battle. And also, you know, interesting to note as well that there's also, you know, really only one character who's a traditional army soldier who was screaming at everyone at Nolte is a, a, a thousand percent the entire movie um, really getting in everyone's face and screaming at everyone. But aside from that, um, which is maybe a sign for Malik's upcoming film about um, a conscious, conscientious objector, a lot of the members of the film don't want to go or, or they're hesitant or they almost have to get a burst of adrenaline rush and rush into there. And that, um, and a lot of times they just don't want to be there almost. It seems that they don't want to progress ahead and, you know, they're being told to by this one man, and this one man controlling all these people. But you clearly see sort of the human nature of, of I think, Terrence Malick believes with pacifism, uh, the idea that they don't want to because it, it, it's wrong. Um, it's not uh, against. It's not in their sort of nature. There's not all these sort of cold-blooded murderers that are part of the army that want to do it, and um, they really show that when they get shot, they're like. Oh, why am I dumb? And there's mistakes that happen, um, which of course happen in war, which you never see in war movies, a, a mistake really. Um, and we see, you know, Woody Harrelson has an amazing sort of death scene. Um, who he plays a minor character, so it's not a, a spoiler or anything, but it's really something he does um, kind of comedically, but is played in such a, a straight kind of dramatic way that it becomes funny and then really heartbreaking and tragic. Um, and then, um, even the Japanese, I don't think um, this is sort of an American movie. It is very much from of the American perspective, but it's not just, you know, oh, and the Japanese people were also there and, and they had a role. Um, as we sort of progress and we see more of them and the Americans get closer, um, as such almost like a protagonist in the field themselves, we start to see the Japanese and he shoots the Japanese very similar to the sort of struggling, dying Americans where they're confused too. Uh, they don't know what's going on. They see all their friends just die in front of them because, you know, um, these, the overwhelming number of the Americans is quite staggering. And, you know, you're trying to defend your homeland and, and you know, it's almost going to be too late. Um, so it's a very sort of, uh, the way he uh, shoots the um, Japanese is very different. Um, but this film also, I think, is, is another film that people would still resonate to because unlike Night of Cups, which has, you know, or uh, Song to Song, I hate to pick on the films, but they very much have very little dialogue. They're very close to silent films. This one has a lot of different war briefings, a lot of talking, um, and, and, and some semblance of a story in terms of ethical debates that they often have. 
Nick Nolte's character has a, a speech about, you know, you've had a war, this is your first war, you just got into it, I've been waiting for this. And it's a sort of interesting sort of um, how being in the army wants you to expect war and you've been waiting for a war, you don't sort of prevent it, you're almost trying to incite it. That was an interesting insight. Um, and just, um, even something some like uh, John Cusack's character, which clearly, you know, the, the constant sort of uh, want is water, but he's depriving them of water. You know, they clearly don't almost, the fighters and the, and the members um, don't want to um, fight it and go along. And they're not sort of roused and moved by this general. They just want water, sort of a basic human uh, uh, element that is part of this earth, of course, we're bringing those earth uh, metaphors again. So really beautiful film, a uh, great sort of a, a star studded cast um, up, 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 up and comers in the 90s. Really beautiful um, and a movie I, I quite enjoyed a bit. Um, and arguably I would say maybe Terrence Malick's best movie. So definitely check out The Thin Red Line, but also check out my next film, which is similar in themes, but different and explores a different aspect of that, which is 2005's The New World. So what I can do to most about the new world, um, it, while similar in themes to the theme, like I said, explore a different aspect of it. Um, and I think definitely the aspect that isn't sort of talked about, um, which is the idea of, of human nature and sort of how we act and civilize and the relationship between nature, similar to the theme line, but between nature and human nature. Um, if you don't know the story, is about Captain John Smith, an English settler who comes to North America um, near Virginia, um, modern-day Virginia, and ex explore and um, you know starts to settle, um, and then occurs of, of course conflicts with the, with the natives, um, and then meets a young woman uh, there named Pocahontas. Of course, you know the Pocahontas story. This is sort of you would say you know Disney's first live-action remake. That did along with. Um, 1,101 Dalmatians, excuse me, but this is of course not made by Disney and very much not a Disney film. Uh, that being said, still a very interesting story and, and a story that's, um, uh, that has such grand ambitions, but I think definitely as this sort of later period, Terrence Malick works, I think he works in, in great grand ambitions. A movie like Tree of Life, I almost put in here. I don't love it, but I really like it. I, I enjoy a lot of the moments. Um, within the movie, and I, I almost chose it here. There's definitely a lot to talk about with that film, but you know, as we sort of get a little bit more smaller and intimate moments, uh, and sort of smaller stories, like something like To the Wonder, I think it works less than when he's working on, you know, the epic nature of war, or um, Tree of Life, you know, the entire existence of the universe, or in the new world, this entire large finding and first interaction with other humans we've never seen before, I think was really um, stunning. And something I really uh, thought was well done. Um, because there's the nature aspect of John Smith coming from sort of the fire and brimstone, England and, and London, coming to uh, this place, which is very much less, um, you would say, has less sort of giant buildings, less sort of industrial, um, and has very much more of a connection to nature. So when they get there, their first instinct is, okay, we're gonna build houses and we're gonna build a little fort and you know that's gonna be our place. Uh, when we sort of explore out, we realize that the, the locals don't have that and um, are much connected to nature. So when John Smith eventually goes, and gets, actually gets captured and goes to, um, doesn't get captured necessarily, but sort of, has to stay there for a little bit. Um, almost gets killed as well, um, but saved by Pocahontas. Um, very much so, we see the element of human nature and we see the element of communication throughout um, sort of base languages. Um, how many times, you know, Pocahontas and Captain John Smith, um, they really do um, fall in love despite having, you know, no similar language. Um, throughout the film, we see them develop sort of a common understanding through the English language. Um, but oftentimes we see them um, just sort of looking at each other using their eyes, Colin Farrell and Koryanka Kilcher, especially Koryanka Kilcher does an incredible job of sort of internal uh, pain, uh, but then also in these moments a great sort of love and lust and love for uh, joy and her connection to the nature and her people's uh, connection to the nature are very strong. Um, and definitely something that Captain John Smith doesn't know how to relate to. Um, but. In this way, uh, 
he's able to sort of uh, be, be in touch with himself a little bit more and, and do a lot of introspective retrospective workings. And we can see both sides of the party, both Pothwell Contest and her people. And sort of he has a great scene where he's sort of playing games and he's running around with them. I think Terrence Malk really loves this. And I think we take the perspective of John Smith at this time because we're often looking up and seeing these beautiful um, and, and uh, trees and, and beautiful sort of grass and sort of, and, and dirt and things in the ground uh, that we often sort of pan up to and we sort of explore in his way and sort of accustomed and we sort of become accustomed so that when he goes back to the camp and everyone's sort of starving and hungry it almost becomes like this idyllic sense to the sort of real sort of uh, dark gritty sense and I think that there's um, a real melancholy of the film um, where we have this sort of great intimate moment and a beautiful moment with nature within the tribe. But then also, you know, even from the start of the film when we see uh, the ships coming in, we understand that, you know, we know the story. We know where this is going to go. That the natives are going to all largely get wiped out. Um, that a lot of their people um, will get moved out of land. You know, they've been there for, for centuries. That they've had for centuries. Um, by sort of just... A superior, I would say, military force um, that that sort of overtook them, and so it brings sort of melancholy because we know that this is the start, but we know where this ends. As so it brings sort of a, a sadness to it, and I think the film definitely leads to that sadness a little bit more when um, we see Pocahontas' story, which is, I think, in a lot of ways tragic, um, even though she sort of wants it, it doesn't go the way she wants to go, and we'll say that um, because. Um, she has to leave her tribe for John Smith because he promises her to bring her back to England. Um, and then oftentimes before that, he's bringing her supplies and trying to establish a relationship with the other, some of the other members are understanding that, you know, that they're not here for peace. We have to sort of wipe them out now before they sort of bring more and have more numbers. Um, Sort of, we've seen this before in terms of uh, native relations with sort of the old, wiser pacifists versus the younger, um, more aggressive uh, members of, of the community, maybe the sons and, and whatnot. Um, but uh, as we sort of shift protagonists in the film, because John Smith slowly stops becoming our protagonist, and we start almost the camera becomes more infatuated with Pocahontas and her beauty um, and, and, her, and her story. So as we sort of see that relationship between John and Pocahontas, now that John is um, at his camp and Pocahontas is at hers, we see a, a, a protagonist shift and we see it now from Pocahontas' viewpoint. Um, and then soon eventually um, she's taken to England. And we do the sort of third person uh, following of her as she sort of goes down the streets and people are amazed by her. So, you know, of course, people have pointed this out before, but the, the new world, of course, can meet multiple meanings of, of, of John Smith's sort of exploration into this new land. And then, of course, Pocahontas' equally same sort of very jarring response to sort of the, the, the stone and what we sort of see as normal and sort of these giant buildings um, that she is uh, unaccustomed to uh, because her people sort of live in sort of these smaller um, tents and, and whatnot um, and well um, teepees and things like that not tents teepees um, but smaller they're not these sort of grand and large buildings that you see in England and then of course she has to sort of put on this dress and sort of put this persona on and in a lot of ways it's sort of a societal critique in, in the times because John Smith he comes from, from a place where there's sort of rules and regulations on how to act but when he goes to um, Pocahontas's village um, the way that he sort of reacts and sort of connects to people is on, on um, a base kind of human understanding of, of touching and feeling um, and sort of looking in each other's eyes and, and the connection with nature um, is very strong and he's able to sort of throw away those societal um, expectations but then when Pocahontas goes she's immediately thrust into those societal expectations the idea of of course she has to wear this gown that you know this culture you know likes this sort of piece of culture but in her culture it was you know strange um, this sort of large gown, she has to put her hair up in a certain way and she has to speak at all times and she can't sort of touch. You know, there's a real sort of uh, instinctual touch and sort of a, a connection between the two have within the beginning of the film. Um, but as, you know, we see Pocahontas go um, and, and Captain Johnson sort of fades away from the story and it's really from her perspective, <laughs> we see less of sort of that connection to nature uh, because, of course, not in a, a sort of a populated, dense place like that. We're often, um, you know, in these big sort of grand buildings, so that connection is lost, but then also, um, so we see sort of a, um, 
a loss of innocence with Pocahontas, but also a loss of self and, and a discovery of self, especially in Malik's later films, have that sort of discussion of um, oneself and that sort of aspect to it. But this one, I think, in the new world kind of at, falls it. Um, plus, it's also a grand epic story. There's multiple protagonists. I think that way it allows the the, the, the movie or the audience to stay engaged and, and follow along um, and, and understand sort of how, just as you're sort of understood in maybe something else, you go into, into someone else. And I think a lot of people enjoy films because of what can only be described as a, as a hypnotic nature, which I definitely appreciate and I understand with something like Badlands or even The New World. I found this film very hypnotic. And I feel a lot of this film at the beginning I'm very interested in and very well invested for about an hour or so. But then after that, it just, it goes on and goes on and there's not enough sort of new things or it doesn't introduce a new element that is interesting or an element soon enough. And then I start to, to wonder and I get distracted and I start to get frustrated. I'm like, you know, what's going on? I need a little bit of direction. I need a little bit of structure. And maybe that's my sort of cinematic shortcomings. Maybe that's where I'm just coming at from right now. But I think as a sort of general viewing view audience member, be wary of Malik's films because they can be um, abrasive and they can be sort of hard and uninviting, especially his, his latter films. But that's about it, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. I can't wait to see what the reactions are to Malik's new film. You guys sort of got some critical backlash and some box house backlash, so you really need this one to be a hit. Who knows, it could be a, a palm door, whenever this could be, you know, a retrospective where I said, oh, I should have done it, a hidden world. But we'll see, um, I don't know, maybe he's finally got around to it. We'll see, maybe this final half will start to connect with me. Um, I'm very excited to see, I'm very excited to do this episode. And like I said, comment below, let me know some of your filmmakers that you want me to see me cover because I don't really have one for next month. Um, I'm thinking about a couple people. They'll all be interesting, of course, um, but still put, put the comments down below if you think there's a filmmaker that I, I should cover because there are plenty that I, I definitely still need to cover. That's about it, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the episode. And until next time, stay tuned. <laughs>